Hi all and welcome back to chapter 5 in CCNA3 version 6 Scaling Networks. Uh, at this stage we reached the routing part of the course, we worked with switches, with STP, VTP and all of that, but now the rest of the course is going to be fully dedicated to dynamic routing. Uh, and we're going to begin with a theoretical overview of dynamic routing and a brief overview of some dynamic routing protocols. But uh, then for the rest of the course, we're going to deep dive into uh, two specific routing protocols, OSPF and uh, EIGRP. Uh, so beginning with this lecture, which is a full theoretical one, we're going to discuss the concept of dynamic routing, what it is and why we need it. And then we're going to look at the different classes of routing protocols like distance vector and link state. And we're going to look at uh, some of the distance vector and link state protocols uh, in a little bit more detail, but we're still going to try to keep it rather brief and do the more focused walkthrough of those protocols in the upcoming lectures, lectures 6 to 10, which are going to focus to totally on uh, EI, GRP, and OSPF. Uh, so, as always, post me if I'm too quick, and feel free to post me, go take a, go take a cup, of co cup of coffee or whatever, because we're going to go through this rather quickly. So let's begin with dynamic routing. And as we've explored through CCNA 1 and 2, we work with routing, which is the process of shuffling traffic in between networks that are separated by a router. Uh, and routing is basically the process when a router is deciding where to send package based on the information in its routing table. Uh, as we worked in CCNA 2 and 1, we worked with static routing, meaning that we have defined routes uh, in a statical manner saying IP route something something and then the routes been put into the routing table and the router can make forwarding decisions. However, you should know that there are tons of networks on the internet and even in a small network there may be uh, maybe a large amount uh, of networks and static routing is very static and as such cumbersome to maintain. So dynamic routing uses routing protocols to automatically learn about routes to remote networks, shows the best path to remote networks and find a new path if the first path fails. Uh, as such, it will mi minimize the need of uh, management and administration as compared to static routing. And it will also provide automatic failover because, well, the routers will be aware of how the network looks and calculate best, best path to network. Uh, and the general way of doing this is that every router within the domain is responsible for advertising its local routes or the local networks that is connected to the router to, to its neighbors. And when it learns networks from other router, it will advertise the learned networks as well. And when the routers are communicating in this way uh, about what networks they, they know, they will eventually end up knowing all networks in the topology. Uh, so. If we go into looking at uh, the dynamic routing protocols, there is, uh, there is a broad classification uh, of routing protocols, and you can say that the first step in the classification process is either interior or exterior gateway protocols, where interior gateway protocols are for routing within an autonomous system or an AS, where, and an AS is basically an administrative boundary. Uh, you can say that your network would most likely be one AS. And exterior gateway protocols are for routing between uh, autonomous systems and different AS, AS and different networks. So uh, the common way is that as a individual network at a site, you would use an interior gateway protocol, but then you would use an exterior gateway protocol to con connect to your ISP and the ISP would internally use some exterior gateway protocol. Uh, looking further down on the different uh, types of uh, IGPs, we have distance vector routing protocols and we have link state routing protocols. I'm not going to go through what they mean right now because it will be done in the upcoming slides. Uh, and for exterior gateway protocols, we, well, uh, as far as this course go, we only have one, which is path vector protocol, BGP, which is beyond the scope of this course and will be discussed further in CCA and A4. Uh, so let us move on to a closer look at the distance difference between IGP and EGP, interior gateway protocols and exterior gateway protocols. Uh, 
So to begin, when you collect a bunch of routers in the same administrative area, you would call this an autonomous system. And if you look on the picture here, you would have one AS here, one AS here, one AS here, and two ISPs that will connect those ASs together. Um, and the interior gateway protocols are for routing within an AS. So here there is one interior gateway protocol, here there's another, and here there's another. And then for the routing between those different AS, then we use an exterior gateway protocol, uh, most usually BGP. So that's basically it. Um, and if you want to have a more a practical way of saying what an AS is, you could say that AS is most commonly one site or one network or one routing domain, really. Uh, so, looking for, uh, further to the different types of routing protocols, let's begin with distance vector routing. Uh, distance vector routing, as we saw in the first picture here, is uh, RIP, Routing Information Protocol, and uh, IGPR and the more which is deprecated and now IE IGPR. So those are both both a distance vector protocol and what uh, signifies a distance vector protocol is that it uses distance to a remote network to describe describe the cost to reach it. Uh, remember whenever there is whenever we talk routing and whenever we talk routes we talk about a cost to follow a specific route and that cost is the metric of the route. Uh, and as I'm sure you remember from previous courses, when there is a routing decision to be made, when an IP package, package reach router, the router is going to see if it has a route matching the destination IP address, and it's also gonna see what metric uh, there is of that route, and it will choose the route with the lowest metric. Um, so distance vector protocols, they use the uh, uses distance to the remote network to describe the metric and they are aware of the direction to the remote network, namely the next top router. So if your router running a distance vector protocol, you will see a route uh, and you will see a metric and what you will be aware of is not the full path to reach the remote network, you will only know where to send it. So uh, in the picture here, if uh, router one is receiving a package and it's going to uh, go somewhere in the distance, Distance, it will only know that it's going to send the package to R2 and then it won't really care what happens next. Uh, so in contrast, uh, link state protocols, they learn about the entire topology of the uh, autonomous system, the AS, and they will forward information to the entire topology when there is a change uh, anywhere within the topology. So this actually, as we will soon describe, makes for, um, makes for the ability to have faster convergence in some cases, but it's also more resource intense because every router has to be aware of more stuff because instead of just being able, uh, being aware of the next top address, every router within the autonomous system is aware of the whole topology. Um, so before going on to the looking at the individual protocols a little bit more, we're going to just have an overlook on some protocol properties. So when we talk about router pro protocols, there are some uh, there are some aspects that are really important that we need to discuss. So first we have speed of convergence, and convergence in uh, in the domain of routing protocols is the speed at which uh, uh, at which all routers have the same view of the topology when all routers are aware of the best path to every network in the AS. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is differences between the speed of convergence, the distance vector protocols are generally slow, RIP uh, version 1 and 2 are slow, uh, version 1 is deprecated and not used anymore, uh, could be used I guess, but you shouldn't. Uh, IGPR is also slow, but uh, the Cisco proprietary EIGPR contains some enhancements that makes the convergence speed quite fast, and you can see that the link state protocols OSPF and IS ISIS is also fast to converge. Uh, next part that's important is scalability, and in this case, it's uh, when it comes to routing protocols, it's most uh, mostly re related to how many uh, how many devices that there can be in the network. Uh, and if we look at the size of the network for the uh, RIP protocols and IGPR, those are small. While as for the other, they can uh, they can house large networks. And being able to house a large network is of course. Uh, is of course important and really in modern day there is no no reason to use uh, or to implement a network with with the routing protocol with drawbacks in my opinion uh, next is use of vlsm we're going to go through that 
uh, in a little while, uh, but you can see that the old and deprecated root version 1 and IGPR does not support VLSM. And next we have resource, resource usage, which, which is of course also of importance because you need to have uh, gear with, with uh, good enough performance to be able to house the routing protocol that you're running. Uh, and you can see that the more we move towards fast convergence and uh, scalability, the higher the resource usage. Uh, then we have implementation and maintenance, which is said by Cisco to be simple for uh, RIP and IGPR, but complex for EGPR, OSPF, and ISIS. And in my opinion, this isn't really true. The basic configuration of all protocols is equally simple, in, in my opinion. What would say that EGPR, EIGPR, and OSPF and ISIS would be more complex is that there is more stuff you can do to them. So I would rather say flexible. Uh, rather than complex. If you're looking at a protocol that is simple to implement, anyone is equally simple to implement, really. The, the commands are basically exactly the same. Uh, so, as we just discussed, metric is a important part of the routing process because it determines the cost to reach a remote, uh, a remote network, and different protocols will use different ways to calculate the metric. So just very briefly, we're going to discuss this in much more detail for OSPF and IGPR. OSPF will use bandwidth, uh, uh, RIP will use hop count, namely how many steps there are from the, uh, from the source network to the remote network, and EGPR, e IGPR will use a compound metric that consists of the lowest bandwidth across all links, the total delay, the load on the links, and the reliability of the links. So we're going to go through that much more in detail, so don't be afraid if you don't remember it. Uh, for now, we're going to look at an overview of how dynamic routing protocols work in general. Uh, and you can say that all types of dynamic routing protocols will follow a general process, but then there are differences in between the different flavors and how these steps are performed. And uh, so basically, when we use dynamic router, each and every router will send and receive routing messages on its interfaces. And routing messages are messages that contains information about routes that other uh, routers are aware, aware of. They're also used as a keep alive uh, kind of thing where you know that your next door neighbor, route, neighbor router is uh, available and up because you re uh, receive those periodical updates. Uh, the routers will also share information with outer routers using the same protocol. So if you have several OSPF enabled routers in the same domain, they're going to share information between each other. Uh, routers exchange the routing information to learn about remote network. And when a router detects a topology change, it will uh, generally advertise that to other routers. Uh, and the general learning process for learning new routes is that uh, whenever the routers in the domain boots up, the route each and every router will begin with detecting its directly connected networks. Then it's going to inform the neighboring routers about their directly connected neighbors. Then they're going to get that information from their neighbors about the neighbors uh, directly connected uh, routers. And they're going to add those routes to the networking table. Then they're again going to inform uh, the neighboring routers about the newly learned routes and this process of learning routes from the neighbors, adding it to adding it to the local routing table, and then sending out advertisements with the updating routing, routing information is going to be repeated until all routers has learned the full network. So basically, the routers will know that they that they are aware of the full networks when they are receiving updates with the same information as they had before. Uh, so again, I know that this is a lot of information to grasp, but I am I fully think that what we're going through in this chapter is going to get stuck when we go through the upcoming chapters where we do some practicals and we deep dive deeper into some specific protocols. So let's move on to discuss classful and classless uh, routing protocols and this is mo mostly for a historical overview. Uh, what you need to know is that classful protocols do not send a net mask, the subnet mask in a uh, routing update. Instead they rely on the classful segmentation of IP addresses. This is only the case for the legacy protocols RIP version, uh, version 1 and IGPR. 
Um, and the behavior here is basically that you need to separate your network or segment your network according to the classful uh, segmentation with class ABC networks and so on and so forth. Uh, otherwise, it will be uh, it will be weird because well, if there is a ten something something network uh, being advertised, then the re version one and IDPR process will assume the uh, the classful mask that is belonging to that network. Uh, however, all modern uh, protocols are classless, which mean that it means that they do send the net mask with with the routing update, and therefore they do support uh, VLSM and classless interdomain routing. Uh, so the next uh, keyword that we're going to discuss a little bit is convergence, and as I said before, in routing convergence is when all routers in the autonomous system knows about all networks within the within the in the AS. So convergence time then is the time that it takes to achieve the state and that process will involve sharing router information, calculating best path to every, every remote network and updating the local routing tables. And of course convergence time is very important because if we have a network that is not converged then the network will not be operating properly because the routers will not be a, a uh, be aware of all remote networks and at least not the best positive remote networks. So for that reason fast convergence speed is desirable uh, With that said we're going to go in to distance vector routing protocols a little bit more remember that uh, Distance vector protocols they share information in between their neighbors and routers are aware of directly connected networks and networks reachable through its neighbors. Uh, they do not know about the topology of the AS and uh, they include uh, RIP version 2 and EIGPR. I would say that those are the modern options where, uh, well, I don't really see any usefulness in RIP version 2 whenever you have the uh, opportunity to use EIGPR. Uh, the downside side with EIGPR is that it's a Cisco proprietary protocol. Um, so looking a little bit at the general distance vector algorithm. Uh, so what is a routing algorithm? Well, you will, you would say that a router, uh, routing algorithm is what is used to detect and react to topology changes, calculate best path and send and receive information. So everything that has to do with the operation of the routing protocol is basically uh, the routing algorithm. And RIP uses a, a routing algorithm that is called the Bellman Ford algorithm. We're not going to care too much about that. Just remember it. Uh, whereas EIGPR uses the diffusing update algorithm or dual, which we're going to explore in detail in a later section. Uh, so let's just have, for historical reasons, a little overview of RIP, uh, the RIP versions, uh, RIP ver ver version 1 and version 2. And as we said, the metric that's used by RIP is the hop count, namely how many routers that there are between the source and destination network. And what you should know about RIP is that it's not very scalable because the maximum number of hops is 15. So there cannot be more than 15 uh, routers in between the source and destination network. So it's using a, uh, an address to forward updates. I'm not going to spell that out, just try to remember it. And as you see, RIP version 2 supports VLSM, classless interdomain routing, uh, route summarization uh, and authentication, and uh, RIP version 1 does not and is to be considered deprecated. Uh, also, let's lo look at the same type of, quest uh, of picture for EIGPR, which is an enhancement of the deprecated IGPR. Uh, and as for the metric, they both use a composite metric consisting of bandwidth, delay, reliability, and load. Um, and it also has an address used to forward routing updates, of course. And as with RIP, you need to use EIGPR if you want support for VLSM, classless interdomain uh, routing, summarization, and authentication. So let's go look a little bit more about EIGPR that we are going to use in this course. Uh, first off, you should know that it's Cisco proprietary, and this is really important because that ensures that, well, you should only use it in a Cisco-only environment. Uh, next, it uses a combined metric, as we've been saying, uh, of bandwidth, load, delay, and re reliability. We're going to deep, uh, deep dive into that in a later chapter. Uh, it does something that is a little bit uh, special with EIGPR is that it does not send periodical updates uh, to 
to the neighbors. Instead, it does send update when a topology change occurs and it only sends updates to affected neighbors. Uh, instead, to maintain and to know that the next door neighbor is still alive, it does send hello packages on regular intervals. Uh, it will. Uh, another thing that is special with EIGPR is that it will man maintain all routes received by neighbors, not just the best. And this is something that allows for quick updates in the routing table, uh, because EIGPR in a network where there are like five routes to one and the same network, EIGPR will install the best route into the routing table, but then still maintain a record of the other routes. And if the first route fails, it can sw swiftly fail uh, or swiftly change to to one of the back backup routes and uh, it allows for a maximum of 255 hops which makes for quite a large network. Uh, with that said we're going to go into link state protocols uh, which are also called shortest path first. Uh, they are considered more complex than distance vector protocols but as we said before the configuration is equally easy the only difference uh, in terms of complexity is that there is more you can do and I don't know maybe the algorithm is, is more complex um, so the link state protocols includes OSPF that we're going to explore further later in this course and ISIS which is beyond the scope of this course uh, both of those uses a Jigstra's algorithm, which is called shortest part path first, and I will refer to it as the SPF algorithm. Uh, and that's the algorithm that is used uh, again to send, uh, uh, to calculate the best path, to send updates, and so on and so forth. And it uses something that is called link state packages to exchange routing updates, and this is done during the initial startup and when a change occurs. So looking at the how the SPF calculates metric, it is done based on the accumulated cost to reach the destination. So if we do a scenario where we're initiating a package from router 1 and it's destined to, uh, to router 5, uh, you can see that there are actually three ways that the package can go. It can either go router 1, 2 and 5, or it can go 1, 4 and 5, or it can go 1, 3, 4 and 5. And in this case, the metric for the first path will be 20 plus 10 equals 30. Um, and the to, for the second path, it will be 5 plus 10 plus 10 equals 25. And the, third uh, and the third path will also be 20 plus 10 equals 30. So in this case, the SPF algor algorithm will consider R1 to R3 to R4 to R5 to be the best route because the combined cost cost is the cheapest even if the number of hops is more so an overview of the link state routing process uh, what is happening when the uh, when the network starts up is that first off each and every router will learn about its own directly connected networks and then each router is responsible for sending a hello package saying hello to its neighbors on the directly connected networks uh, and then each router will build a link state package which contains the state of each directly connected link. So each and every router after saying hello to its neighbors and all that, each router will uh, build a link state package which says here are my directly connected networks. Then it's going to flood this LSP to all neighbors and they will store this uh, information in their database. Uh, and this is going to be updated with uh, in, in the next stage, each and every router will add this new information to, to their LSP and flood that. And uh, at the end, each router will use those LSP to construct, a, to construct a database containing a complete map of their topology. And then they can individually compute the best path to every destination networks. So looking at the pros and cons of link state routing protocols before we end, the benefit is that each router maintains a complete view of the networks and this, this allows for fast convergence because every router is uh, aware of every path to, uh, to the network. Uh, then updates are event driven so there is no unnecessary flooding of router updates instead as with EIGPR we use low packages to uh, to maintain adjacencies with neighboring routers 
is hierarchically designed and we're going to see why that is a benefit in a later lecture. Uh, however, on the downside is that it's both memory and CPU intense and that is an effect of every router maintaining the complete view of the network and the LSP flooding will um, can impact the bandwidth. However, LSPs will only be flooded uh, during initial startup and when there is a change in the topology. So that's it for this introduction to dynamic routing. If there are any questions, you can ask them in class or leave them in the comments field and I will try to answer as best I can. When we get back, we're going to look, uh, spend the last chapters looking deeper on EIGPR and OSPF and do practicals. So thank you for now and see you next time for chapter six.